Yeah, we'll start. So, we last session I think we talked about uh, structures. We also talked about pointers, and maybe no, we didn't talk about array of structures, did we? Oh, we did. Okay, so today we will use all of that, but I want to introduce a idea which we should have introduced some time ago, which is the idea of a function. And then we'll come back and do pointers and structures and all. So I'll first talk about what is a function. Some of you would already know what is a function, but anyway, for reasons of completeness, we'll have to talk about what is a function, how does a function work, why should there be functions, and how do you use a function. Now functions in C, I must tell you, are pretty primitive. You know, you can't do much with the functions. Uh, but as you will move ahead, I would like you to develop a comparison. For example, uh, some of the best function handling you will see in a language called JavaScript, which is a more recent language, especially the JavaScript ES20, which was created in 2020. You, you can see how the progression of uh, function development, starting from something in 1969, 1970, to 2020, in last 50 years, how the functions have evolved. And it's very interesting to see. So C is like the most rudimentary way of dealing with functions. Uh, anything and everything can be better than this. Uh, but please develop this comparative picture as we move forward. Uh, so today we'll learn what is the most rudimentary, most stupid, most ridiculous uh, way of writing a function, which is the way C allows you to do. Uh, so what is a function? Well, the argument for a function is very simple. Uh, when we write a program, let's say I write a program P1, and I write statements, S1, S2, S3, S4, and so on. Uh, very often you will notice that, let's say S2, S3, S4, the same kind of statements occur at S100, S101, S102, and so on. So you will see very often that you will be reusing these blocks of code which are here and which are here again and again. Obviously, anybody will say, can't you modularize this? Can't you in some way abstract this out into a function and, uh, you know, put these all inside some kind of a function which I can call and give it a name. Let's call it F1. So instead of writing these things here, I'll just call F1 here and F2 here. Oh, sorry, again F1 here. And this same process may be repeated somewhere else in the program also. So rather than writing these statements at every place, uh, it would be mu more, much more convenient to write these statements in one place and call them from here. So in the altered code, I would say S1, then I would have F1 here, and then somewhere here it would be F1. So whenever this function is encountered, the control would jump to this part and it would execute this part and then come back again and resume from this portion. So that is what we would like it to happen. Now why would this style be better than this style? Now if you look at it in a holistic way, P1 and P2 are doing exactly the same thing. They are not doing anything different. Only thing is they are doing things differently. S1, uh, P1 is just repeating all the lines again and again. I have depicted only twice, but it can occur many more times. Uh, whereas P2, if you see, is, we say it is more modular. Why do we say it is more modular? Uh, simple reason is that I have captured these repeated statements in the body of this code. And instead of repeating these statements everywhere, I am simply calling them with a name, F1. So F1 is a name that I have given to this block of code, which I want to execute from various places. Now, why would this be better? One, it looks neater. Uh, it reduces the size of the code. But those are trivial uh, gain. What is more important is, suppose you wanted to change 
the way this piece of code is implemented. You wanted to optimize it. What I would have to do here? I would have to make the changes in this part. I would have to make the changes in this part. And if it's repeated in 10 different places, I would have to change it in 10 different places. That would be, uh, just to say, very tedious and also prone to error. Why would it be prone to error? Because I may do a change here and I may forget to do a change here. So this piece of code will be executing differently and this piece of code will be executing differently. Though my intention was not that. My intention was what? I want this code and this code both to change. Now what it happened is because of my laziness, because of my tardiness or because of the uh, urgency, I changed only here but forgot to change here. And, and that would be a problem because this code would end up behaving differently and uh, this would be something else, which would be just a mistake. Whereas, if I use this, I make the change only here, the change will be reflected in this invocation, the change will be reflected even in this invocation. So there would be consistency. And uh, in computer science, anything which gets us to con consistency, we like it because A, it reduces the burden of error the error is reduced, probability of error is reduced. Other thing, the code looks more structured and more easy to understand. I, I look at this code, I know, okay, here this function is getting called and the same function is getting called later. So it's much more easier for readability of a program that I should uh, put it in a uh, piece of code like this rather than write it like this. This is too elaborate and uh, also prone to error as we just talked about. So nobody uses this style, people try to do it. Again, <laughs> I must say this, in the initial days it's always comfortable to write one monolithic piece of code rather than writing a modular code. Uh, but this is a habit we must cultivate and I have realized that this habit doesn't come easily. I have still seen a lot of people after 2-3 years of graduation, they still write code without converting it into functions. And unless you make a serious effort to do that, that style stays with you and it leads to somebody looking at your code and uh, you know their nose going up, uh, irritating code, right? So why, why does that happen? Because you have not modularized your code. Nobody likes, believe me, nobody likes when you write code like this, very bad, okay? But you have to get out of that habit and con try and convert. So whenever you write a program, check whether this piece of code, can I convert it into a function and can I call it? rather than just repeating that piece of code again and again. In fact, your antenna should go up the moment you see this kind of code repeating. You, you should immediately think, uh, oh, can I not modularize it? Can I not put inside a function? Uh, and that marks the difference between a professional coder and a bacha coder, correct? Uh, so so uh, th this, is, this is the not a good style, this is style. And so we are going to learn how to create functions. It's very easy how to create functions. So again, the trick in creating functions is not so much in writing the code in the function, but to modularize it. And we are going to understand how to do that. And we are going to see the style develops over time. And uh, let's, let's try and do it. Okay. Now let's take a common, common requirement, uh, which is, let's say, I often need to read an array and I often need to sum the elements in an array. Let's take just this requirement that often in my program I am going to read arrays and I am going to sum the elements in an array. Now can I con convert that into a function and call it some name? So let's create that function then let's learn how to call that function and then we will see little more things about the modalities of calling function. So I am going to write a function what does this function do? It takes two parameters. Every function generally takes parameters, not mandatory. But I have rarely seen a function without parameters being very useful. Now, a little thing about what do you mean by parameterization of a function? Why do we need parameterization to a function? See, any block of code which you write, even if it is called from multiple places, like first time it is called, you may ask to sum one array. Next time you call, you may not want to sum the same array, right? You would like to sum a different array. The summation that you want to do here at one part of the code will be on ARR1 and the number of elements in ARR1 will also be different. At a later part in the code, you want to sum 
ARR2 and the number of elements in ARR2 will also be different, correct? So basically what we are saying is, unless you introduce the idea of parameterization, this function and this function which is called at two different times, you want them to do exactly the same thing. What is exactly the same thing? You want them to sum the elements in an array. The activity is the same, but the array, that is the input to that function, is going to vary. Sometimes it is one array, sometimes it's going to be another array, sometimes it's going to be a third array. So I should have the flexibility of writing a function in such a way that it, with adequate parameterization, I will be able to use it multiple times. If my array is, uh, sorry, if my function is very rigid, what do I mean by rigid? It will work only on a particular array because then you are not using reusability. Ideally, what you should do? You should write a function with adequate parameterization so that I can use that function much more, many more number of times and it becomes more reusable, more modular. Uh, so that is some care, again, which we learn over time. First day, we don't get everything, even, even now, if I write a function, I, 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 I remember I keep coming back to it and adding a few more parameters. Or first time you write it, it's still very rigid. Next time you write it or look at it again, you know, you look at it again, you realize, oh, I could add this parameter and increase the viability of my function much more. So the clever thing lies in how do you choose the parameters, not just what the function does, but how do I choose to parameterize that function? And I'll tell you without batting an eyelid that this comes not by education, it comes by practice. If you write more and more functions, you start realizing, oh, I should have added more parameters or these parameters should not be there uh, and, and things like that. Okay, so let's, without too much, let's write a small function. What is the name, of, what, what, what's the purpose of this function? It's to add the elements in an array, whichever array you give it. It will add the elements in an array and give me something back, which is the sum. Okay, so let's just write that function. First, I'd write it here, then we'll code it here and then we'll learn how to call it with different arrays. Okay, so I'm writing a function. So let's get into the modalities. It's very easy. So let's give a name to that function. So let's call it find sum. This is the name of the function. Again, name of the function should follow the same rules that you use for variables. They should not be letters. They should not start with letters. They should not contain spaces. Whatever are the generic rules we use for variable names, they apply for functions also. So I have a function whose name is find sum. Now, whenever I create a function, there are two things to remember. First, let's start with this parameters. Look at the way I am declaring the parameter. I am saying int int arr square bracket and int int size and it returns an int. There are some things happening there. I'll illustrate that. Okay. So look at Look at this is called the prototype of a function or also called, some people call it prototype, some people call it signature, the signature of a function. What does it say? It captures a few things, find sum, okay? Uh, underscore is not mandatory, I just wrote it. So find sum is the name of the function. Every function ought to have a name. Not really true. In C, they ought to have a name. In other advanced languages, like when you come to Java, for example, or even if you come to JavaScript, we'll hear or we'll talk about anonymous functions. Today, nobody writes function like this. People use what is called as the functional programming style so that you can appreciate the better style, right? So C is a good language, okay? So the name of the function should be like that. Find sum, okay? That is the name of the function. Now, how many parameters do you think it takes? The way I wrote it, it takes two parameters. First parameter is array. array. It can be any array. Okay, we'll, we'll soon work with it. It can be any array. I have not indicated any value in the square bracket. That is not by error, that is by design. You should not give any value in the bracket because I don't know what array I'm going to deal with. My array may be 100 elements. 
my array may be thousand elements or five elements i don't care and i don't want i don't want to know so it is some kind of array okay we don't we re really don't care whether it's an array I, I i mean we really don't care what is the size of the array to that provision we are passing an extra parameter called size which we will pass to this function this is the size of the array we are talking about okay and i can't resist commenting only in c where with the array you have to also tell the function how big that array is all other languages can figure out if you give them an array the function itself will figure out how big is that array you don't have to tell it it is only in again at the cost of repeating myself uh, backward languages like c you have to pass the size of the array because in c i told you last time there is nothing called an array uh, internally c internalizes this as a pointer because there is no array it is a pointer and a pointer doesn't know how long it should go right pointer only knows it points to the first element how many elements are there how does it know the pointer is not smart the pointer is a stupid guy he doesn't tell you how long i should go and that's why i need an extra parameter called size to tell me how many values are there starting at this value correct okay so okay since we are uh, at that point uh, okay let me complete this and i'll come back so find some everybody is convinced takes two parameter first is an array second is a size of the array what does it give back it gives back an integer that's why i have said int there so what is the value it gives back the sum of all elements which obviously is an integer it gives back that integer as a result the consequence of calling find sum is i get back an integer which is a sum of all elements fair enough now an equivalent i'm not writing the body of the function yet an equivalent uh, declaration let me write it at the top of that an equivalent thing of this could have been int find sum i could have said int star ptr also this line and the line above it are sort of equivalent all of you agree because we we established in an earlier session that the name of an array is nothing but the pointer to the first element so if you see my two equivalent declarations they are identical in one arr is a pointer uh, sorry arr is an array in the second declaration i am treating it as a pointer doesn't matter both are equivalent only thing is if you don't like ptr i can call it arr also okay <laughs> no problem i can call my parameters anything that i want my choice fair enough so this is what is int find sum this is called the prototype of the function or this is called the signature of the function so first we must invest some time in figuring out what should be the signature of our function i i see this happening uh, less people don't think so much about the signature of the function but i i really recommend after years of programming that you should invest a, a substantial amount of time saying what should be the signature of my function name is not that important what is important as i just said is what are the parameters i am going to take and what kind of return value i am going to give back now return value could be a integer could be anything could be a structure could be whatever okay and uh, here of course we have a integer now let's write the body of the function let's quickly write the body of the function so in the body whatever variables i create live in that function and die in that function so whatever i am going to create here is not available outside the function it is used only within the function what is available outside is only what the function gives back so in the in the general sense of the word a function should be looked at as a black box now why do i say it is a black box very simple the reason i say it is a black box is the guy who is calling the function he doesn't care what you do inside it as long as you give him the in this case the sum of all elements how you are going to get the sum of all elements 
whether you are going to use a pointer or whether you are going to use it as an array or do something else or jump through whatever hoops you want is none of my business. As an outsider who is calling this function, what you do inside is your business. You give me back. Give me back what? The sum of all elements. I don't give a damn what happens inside the function. That is what we call as a proverbial black box. Opaque. What happens inside the function ought to be opaque to the outside world. Outside world doesn't care. The guy who is writing the function, it is solely his responsibility to design the function, to write whatever he has to write inside the function. And as long as he is faithful to the objective of that function, we are fine. Later we'll talk, why is this important? Actually, it's very simple to understand why this is important. Today, I might be using one algorithm in writing that function. Tomorrow, I may discover a better algorithm. So I should be free to change my algorithm internally. What happens to the outside world as long as I get the sum of values, whether you are doing the sum of values this way or that way, I, as long as you get me the sum, internally what revolution you do is none of my business. Okay? So that is another advantage of this modularity, of the black box approach. In fact, as you will go into future semesters, this black box approach will be even more accentuated because when we move to object-oriented programming, when we now move to functional programming, the, the concept of black box becomes very important. Why? Why is this black box idea very important? Very simple reason. See, in no project, there is only one party involved, right? All projects that you will ever work with will involve teams. There are no prima donnas in software where one guy writes everything. So, one guy will be responsible for one piece of code and he specializes in that piece of code. And the other guy does something else, correct? So now, when one guy is doing this piece of code, the contract between him and the rest of the world should not change too often. And what is that contract? What parameters do I need? And what I give back? Now, what happens inside the function is generally done by the other guy. So you will see in any big project, there will be several people who are there. Some will be creating the functions. Some will be using the functions. Uh, and creating maybe more functions, right? So, what the other guy is doing, as long as he is doing it optimally, and as long as he is faithful to the parameters, I don't care. And I should not care. Because if I start caring, then I kind of become dependent on that implementation. I should be independent. I should be hands-off, right? Okay. So, let, very quickly, let's capture the body, and then we'll move on. So, what do we do? We declare a variable int sum then we declare an i which can use to iterate just like we do in any main code then i write for i equal to 0 i less than now i use this parameter size i is equal to i plus 1 and then i write sum is equal to sum plus ARR of i, like you do, and then you say return sum. That's it. Correct? This is the body you write, like any other body that you write. We said int sum, int i. We went from 0 to size, uh, size minus 1, i is equal to i plus 1, sum is equal to sum plus ARR of i. Uh, I should have initialized sum to 0, uh, and then we return sum. That's it. This is the function. Clear? Now, what is the beauty of the function? I can call it with any array, and it will return the sum. Okay? So, we will soon talk about how to use it, but I think we can start writing it, and then I will show you how to call it and all. Practice lab 22, please. Write a C program to illustrate functions. So we'll first create the function. Normally it is a habit, and later we'll discuss why is this not so important, to create functions on the top and use them below. So we'll create the functions even before we create main. Main is also a special kind of function, which is only recognized by the operating system. So today we are creating our own function for the first time, and then we'll move. So we are creating a function called find sum. Look at the way we are creating it. So, int arr, size, 
Is this clear? We are just writing the body of the function. We are writing the function before main. Please cultivate that habit first. Then we can change it. It's not mandatory, but in the beginning, write it be before. So, we have declared int sum equal to 0 and an i. And we'll just write a simple loop for sum is equal to ARR of i. Okay. Is everyone clear about the function, please? We, whatever I just wrote on paper, I wrote. We wrote there. So, int find sum, int arr, array, int size, uh, int sum equal to 0, i, and all that. Right? Shall we start writing the main? Everybody clear, please, what we wrote? Find sum, we have written. Uh, int ARR, whatever. Now we are writing main. So we'll write step by step main. Now we are going to find sum of three different arrays. Okay, just to play with it a little bit. Now I'm not going to waste time uh, creating an array, <laughs> then reading elements of an array, doing scanf and all that. I'll just show you, though that is the right way of doing it, but just to reduce the tedium for us, I'm just going to show you what is called static initialization of an array. Okay, let me just write it here first. This is our thing. So I'll just show you static initialization. See, normally we create an array like this. And then fill in the elements using user input by doing scanf, correct? So I'm just showing you an easier way of doing it, though that is not the intended way, okay? This is just to try it out in our code. We can use what is called static initialization. So we can say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Okay, this is called directly filling, it the, filling the array, not taking it from the user. This is also called static initialization. Okay. Does everybody get it? It's not what is recommended, but often what is used. Okay. This is just to quickly create an array with some elements. Example. So we'll create using this uh, and then call that function and do it. So let's do this. Okay. So we'll say int uh, arr1, int arr15 is equal to, we are writing at the last. So that this is somewhere in the middle. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Okay, so this is how I create an array in static initialization. You, you want to create it some other way, it's fine. This is just put to reduce work. Then I'll create uh, another array. Let's say int arr2 of, let's say, three elements. Int arr2 uh, of 1, 2, 3. Okay, and let's knock those two off, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the first array has five elements, the second array has three elements, and we are going to see invocation of the function uh, two times. So we'll go down, yeah. So we will say now uh, int k or something, int r, let's call it result, int r1 is equal to, now look at the way. Now I am calling the function and some definitions will have to be said at this point. So name of the function is find sum. So I am saying r1 is equal to find sum, find sum and I will pass arr1 as the first parameter and the size, which is 5. And then I'll say uh, printf 
sum of the first array, sum of the first array is equal to percentage D uh, R1, comma R1. And then I'll repeat more or less these two lines again. I'll call it R2, 15 and 16. Yeah. So let's say int R2 is equal to find sum of ARR2 and 3 and R2. Okay. Now I'll pause here. There are a few things which I want you to understand at this stage and then we'll proceed. Okay, now let me make a few comments on the code. These are called formal parameters. That means whatever parameters that I use, those are called the parameters. Those parameters which I use while writing the function and in whose terms I have written the function, those parameters are called formal parameters. These are called formal parameters. Okay? Because I have written the function using these parameters. In my function body, you see, I have used ARR and I have used size. Size here and ARR here. So, the parameters used while writing the function, this is here, these parameters are always referred to as formal parameters. Now, this line, this line is called the function invocation. Invocation means using the function. Okay? This is called the invocation of the function. This is called the definition of the function. And these parameters, which is namely ARR1 and 5, these two parameters, these ones are called actual parameters. These are called also actual parameters. So, for this invocation, the actual parameters are ARR1 and 5. For this invocation, the actual parameters are ARR2 and 3. These are the actual parameters. So, while invocation happens, ARR takes the value of ARR1 and size takes the value of 5, first time. And it does the work, returns a value. Second time, ARR2, uh, sorry, ARR takes the value of ARR2, size takes the value of 3 and returns something. So, at every invocation, the actual in parameters are substituted for formal parameters. Important thing to remember is formal parameters never change. Actual parameters change from one invocation to another invocation. How many invocations do we have here? Two. You can have 20 if you want. Okay. But we have used two. So these invocations use the actual parameters and this is the actual return value. This is the formal return value. Right? Sum is the formal return value and this is the actual return value R1, R2. So that value gets returned in R1 or R2. So that's how it works. So you should be clear what are formal parameters and what are actual parameters. Does everyone understand this? Actual means what are used while calling. Formal means what are used when writing the function, when creating the function. That happens only once. You create the function only once and you use it many number of times. When you use it, the parameters that you pass are called actual parameters. When you write it, the parameters that you use are called act, uh, formal parameters. Okay? So those are the formal parameters. These are called the actual parameters. Okay? Now this is important because this nomenclature is very important. What are actual? What are formal? And this will always happen. This is what gives reusability because the actuals can change every time and the formals are used only to create the body of the function. So that's why we do this. Uh, now let's let's uh, run this. Yeah, now run it. Okay, as expected, we should have given some spaces. The sum of the first array is 150. Sum of the second array is 6. I should have 
given a space in between. That's okay. So, I think now you know what is a function. How do I invoke a function? Now, we have seen two invocations, as I am sure you understand by laws of, law of generality. There could be 20 invocations. And that is what is, makes a function more reusable. So, uh, we have created the function. We have called it with parameters. And now, is everyone clear about this? Yes? No? It's not very difficult to understand. Now, in any given code, you will several, write several functions. And then you will have the main body of code, which will kind of integrate. Now, one function can call other functions also. No problem. right? Uh, and, and this can go ad infinitum. A lot of people ask, how, how deep the nesting can happen? Nesting means one function calling another function, that function calling another function. How deep can it go? No limit. There is a limit, obviously. There is a limit to everything. Uh, but that limit is so big that you don't have to worry about it. Right? Uh, you will never be challenged with that limit. It won't bother you. Okay? Uh, later we will know, when we know a little bit more of operating systems and all, there is internally something called a stack. Maybe I should talk about it now. So there is something called a stack. The main function puts the parameters on the stack and the calling function, call function, picks up the parameters from the stack. Okay, since we are there, and you guys happen to be smart, uh, let's talk about how do we, how does this happen internally? But it would be helpful later to understand this, this idea which I am talking about. Okay, now listen to this carefully. Uh, now I am calling the function here, as you can see. What really happens in any operating system including the operating system you are having, there is something called a stack. This is an internal data structure, which we will later learn and you will become extremely familiar uh, with this data structure. There is something called a stack. Now, stack has a very basic principle. It is called a LIFO data structure. Anybody guesses? Any guesses what is LIFO? Okay, very good. LIFO stands for last in, first out. Whoever comes in last goes out first. It's called LIFO. There is a cousin data structure of stack called a queue. First in, first out. No, yes. First in, first out. Right? Now you understood. Right? So, the data structure which has this principle of first in, first out is called a queue data structure. Stack, not like that. LIFO. So, you have these guys. Whoever came in last goes out last. That is called LIFO. Okay? Uh, these data structures, later we will learn how to create in our programming. But ordinarily, we don't create them. We learn them just to learn them. But in real life, we borrow them from a library, just like you have the std lib. We'll use a library from where we'll get a stack and a queue. Uh, but why am I talking about the stack? What happens when I say find sum, when I invoke find sum, there are two parameters. One, I told you, is a pointer, correct? I told you, in, in C, there is nothing called an array. It's all created for our imagination and comfort. So, what happens here is, when I call a function, internally, you don't see it happening, internally, ARR1, ARR1, that is a pointer, ARR1, and this value, 5, is passed onto the stack, internally. This happens behind the scene. So, they do it here while calling, and the function which gets called, this body of code, so this guy pushes on stack, that is the invoker pushes the parameters on the stack, and this guy okay, pops the parameter in the reverse order. So this gets first, and this comes second. So that is why ARR1 becomes ARR, and size becomes 5. Okay? So the calling code, the called code, sorry, 
pops pops from stack internally this is what happens the caller pushes this onto the stack and the called guy pops them from the stack uses it so he has popped them from the stack so they are gone from the stack and then whatever the answer that comes answer which the called code is producing that answer in this case let's say the answer is 150 that is also pushed onto the stack so parameters are popped result is pushed so if you understand this function what it is doing internally behind the scene it is hungrily taking the parameters from the stack popping them from the stack doing what it has to do and then whatever result it has got that result is popped back sorry result is pushed back onto the stack so the stack now contains only the result and what the caller will do that is line 15 will do it will push the parameters on the stack and pop the result from the stack once it is available are you getting me no yes, yes sir. it's important not very important at this stage to understand but at some stage you will have to understand this very intimately that the caller pushes the parameters on the stack and the call guy retrieves the parameters from the stack pushes the result to the stack and the caller sorry the call caller yes caller picks up the result from the stack so if you realize what's happening the stack is being used as a mechanism to communicate between the main code and the function code whatever the main code and the uh, function is communicating they are communicating via the stack so internally the stack is the instrument of collaboration okay sometimes as i showed here the fun the stack is an instrument of collaboration when you desire a lifo collaboration sometimes the instrument of collaboration is a queue here it's a stack but in some other cases where we'll discover we will talk about a queue as a mechanism to communicate between this piece of code and this piece of code it's very important to understand this at some stage because in real life you'll have different pieces of code doing their own thing the question for all of us for computer science people is it's not just writing these independent guys but also to establish an effective channel of communication between these people that is equally important as writing the code and lot of people ignore this they write this code and this code optimally but you know they do not write an effective communication channel between this performance will suffer this will especially become important for you guys and especially the guys who are doing aiml which is all of us uh, why because there and it's important to understand the your main code as we call the driver code that will run on a cpu and your ai code will not run on a cpu ai code on cpu where on a gpu gpu is called your nvidia graphics processing unit of course you will not use this nvidia your nvidia that you have on your laptops is a very puny toy nvidia you'll need powerful N nvidia like we have here so now your cpu and your gpu will write so if you see here look at this code itself here there is no parallelism it's very trivial chiller code okay but when you write when you write ai ai kind of code there also you will call a function so that function will not run on the same hardware on which your main will run here main and uh, main and uh, function are running on the same same infrastructure there it will run on different infrastructures there this there won't be a stack because stack is sitting on one machine only there you will have to have more powerful more effective ways of communicating between the main code and the called code called code means find some right so there we'll have cpu to gpu channel how to set up a cpu to gpu channel stack is just a very simple idea we will what i'm just saying is we will have to blow up this concept further to understand how this communication happens this is the first cut first primitive way of communicating between a driver code a lot of people call this main 
as the driver code and the other is called the function code. Okay, this is nomenclature, not crucial, but this is what happens when the parameters are called here and passed there. Sorry, created here and passed there. Now, we have written a small function which does find sum. Like that you can write any number of functions. But I would like to touch upon, since we have discussed pointers, so another idea which I need you to know. We have written the function using array, correct? Yes, no. Now, can we change the body of our function? Not in the main, let's write an array. It's more comfortable. But in the body of the function, it's not necessary to write an array. The other day we discussed. An array is not an array. It's only a pointer. So, can we alter that code of the function to say, okay, I'll just change it a bit. Uh, I'll change the header first. Go up. So, instead of saying ARR square bracket, what will I do? I'll say int star ARR. I can call it just because it's a pointer, it need not be called P or PTR, right? It can be called whatever I want. We'll remove the square bracket. Fair enough? Does everybody agree with my change? Is a pointer to the first element. I'm not changing anything very dramatically. I'm just changing it. Now, in place of that sum is equal to sum plus, everything else will remain the same. In place of sum is equal to sum plus ARRI, I can still say that. But what is a better way of saying it? Star of ARR plus I. Correct? I want to go to the ith element via the pointer. ARR points to the first element. ARR plus I will point to the ith element. But I don't want the pointer. I want the value at that pointer. I am not interested in the pointer. I don't want to add pointers. I want the value sitting at that pointer. And how do I get the value? I dereference the pointer. So I say star of that. So I can alter that line. Sum is equal to sum plus. Those of you who can't see that star is a little faint. So sum is equal to sum plus star of. Star means dereferencing of. ARR plus I. Agreed? ARR plus I will take me to the, will be the ith pointer or pointer to the ith element. I should say pointer to the ith element. And star of that is going to give me the value, which is what I want. So, and every time I am going to add first, zeroth element, first element, second element, so on. Is this going to work? I just changed from using an array as an array to using it its count pointer counterpart. Correct? You are with me? Okay. So let's just try this out. Okay. The answer obviously doesn't change. Answer is the same. Agree? Okay. Now let's play with this little more. Now I am going to introduce us another idea. Okay. I'll create a notional function. Don't worry what it does. It does something useless. But there is a reason for creating this useless function. So just bear with me for a few minutes and then you'll understand why I'm doing it. Okay. So we'll change our program. So we'll just change over to a new program. Now we'll introduce one more idea uh, which is important. This is very important. This is called, what happens to the parameter? The, see, we just talked about one kind of relationship between the actual parameters and the formal parameters, correct? Now, we said they are passed on the stack. I said the caller, that is the main program, puts the parameters on the stack. And then the called program or called function picks it up from the stack and puts the result back. I didn't tell you the whole story. Or rather I told you, ah, okay, let's say, let's put it that way. That is not the whole story. There's a little more twist to that story, which I want you to get now. A small twist, but an important twist. Okay. So, let's just write a trivial function. Okay. Let's understand 
Okay. The name of my function is f. Okay. Now, also let's assume that I am not expecting anything back from the function. This is also common. I want the function to do something. That's all. I don't want it anything. If that is the case, I have to say void here. Void means I don't want anything back. Okay. Now, the function is going to take an x, int x, okay, and it is going to do a simple thing, x equal to x plus 1, and again x is equal to x plus 1, or I mean you don't need to do that, you need to say x is equal to x plus 2. And then it is going to say printf here, percentage d backslash n x. Okay, let's write it and then I'll show you what fun we are going to have with this function. Okay, so void function, it says a parameter in text and what does it do? It says x is equal to x plus 2. Just does some addition to x and then, in, uh, sorry, you say printf, no, 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 don't say it that way. Just say value inside function, value inside function, inside a9, inside a, inside a, inside a, inside function, a, a thesis, percentage d, and let's print x. Ah. Comma x. Okay. I think everybody gets what we are trying to do here. What is the formal parameter here? X. What am I doing to the formal parameter? I am adding some number to that formal parameter and representing, uh, printing that number. Right? So, value inside the function is equal to X. Okay. Now, I will say, go back, go to main. I will say int k equal to 5. Okay. Now, I will call that function f of k. And then I will say okay, print f value of k, value in main, value in main equal to percentage d k. Okay. okay. Let me put this in simple English first, what we are trying to do. Okay. What are we trying to do? We said k equal to 5, then we are calling the function. So, what happens now? k goes on to the stack. Agreed? We just discussed this. K gets pushed onto the stack. What is the value of K? 5. 5, no? Then it goes to X. Uh, sorry, it goes to the function. Functions picks up the value. That is called popping the value. From the stack, function gets what? 5. Function gets 5. It does 5 is equal to 5 plus 2 or whatever. X is 5, so it does 2. So now, I, it prints 7, yes. So, what will I get on line 5 is 7, everybody agrees? What will I get on line 11? 11. Will I get 7 or 5? No, because you got it. <laughs> now, the question is, okay, first let us see what we get and then let us rationalize why we are seeing what we are seeing. Okay? First, let us just do it once. Okay? So, then we will debate why we are getting what we are getting. Okay? Let us just run it once. Then, let us see. Okay. As, as somebody described, 
value inside the function is coming as 7 as expected because 5 was passed, 5 plus 2 is 7, so 7 came. But if you see the value outside, now you go back to the code, value outside is 5, I want you to note that. Okay, now, <laughs> now there is something which I, which is not correct, right? Not correct in the sense, something which doesn't gel. I am saying, I am calling that function with k as a parameter. k is my actual parameter. Agreed? k is received by the function. What is the function doing to k? Adding 2 to it. Correct? And then, that's it. Then, why is it and, and that is ratified. And line 5, line 5, I am seeing the value 7 as, as expected. But the anomaly is not there or the confusion I am sure is not there. The confusion is there if at all on line 11. Why is line 11 when the k has been already incremented to 7? Why is it that when I print that k in line 11, why does it show? 5 only and not 7. Okay. okay. Now, this is important to understand and it's implemented in almost all languages which came after C. This is very important. What does this mean? Is, and that's why I said I didn't tell you the complete story. The complete story is something like this. When I pass the parameters on the stack, when I push the parameters on the stack from the main, there is that that is correct, but actually I don't push the actual parameters onto the stack. I push a copy of the parameter onto the stack. This is a very important statement with lot of purport on it, lot of emphasis on it. The point I'm making, I'll say it again. When I said the parameters, the actual parameters, here k is the actual parameter. I said the parameter is pushed on the stack. I said that. I still say it. But it is not the original k which is pushed onto the stack. It is the copy of the original k. Whenever in C we do this pushing on onto the stack, the original never goes. What goes is a duplicate, is a copy. Now, why is this done is, I'll argue it differently, is another story. But what happens, what the mechanics is, of k, a copy is made. The copy goes to the function. The, when the function is getting that variable, it is not the original variable, it is a copy of the variable. So the copy it has got, copy it has made plus 2, the copy has changed and then if you print that copy, I am getting 7 because the alteration which the function is working on is not on the original but is in the copy. The original never went to the function. So the function altered the value but it did alter the value not with the original because the original was never sent to the function at all. A, a, the original stayed with the caller. A copy of that original, a copy of K actually went on to the stack which was received by the function. The function took that value. It thought it is K but it is actually not the original K. It is the copy of the K and the copy was altered to become 7 in this case. So in the function when we displayed the value, we got as expected, we got 7. Original never went. And in the main, the K never went. The original K never went. Copy of K went. So when I printed the K in the driver, in the main, what did it show? It showed the original value because the main has the original value. And the function has got the duplicate, the copy. It worked with the copy, it changed the copy. But though it changed the copy, the copy, the change is not reflected on the original. The original stayed as it is. And that's for we get the value as 5 in the original. Is everybody clear on this? This is called 
this there is a name given to this this is called call by value semantics so the fun what, what does it mean the function only receives the value via the copy never the original so that is why it is called call by value semantics or call by value invocation in c most of the time it is call by value semantics are you with me okay now is everybody absorb this by default a copy is made yes now i am going to step back just the time to hit one more idea on this call by value now i am going to confuse you so far are you clear now you may be thinking oh this is very trivial call by value copy is made given to me i work on the copy original stays as it is yes okay now let's write one more piece of code okay we'll write one more piece of code and i will can we go okay we'll change to one more code and i'll show you something else but it's not a contradiction if you think deeper it is still call by value only thing it doesn't appear like call by value so appears like a contradiction but sir not a contradiction okay what i am going to show you so please go to practice lab 24 yeah please be in practice lab 24 now i am going to write a function at the top called a function which receives an array and the size of the array as a parameter and increments every element in the array by 1 you are with me it receives an array of integers and some size as parameters and what does it do to every element of the array yes it adds some one okay so let's write that function let's it doesn't return anything doesn't matter okay void i'll give a name to that function increment some function i'll call it a name increment it takes two parameters what are the two parameters an array which i can declare it as a pointer or as an array let's declare it as an array int arr square bracket and int size like we did earlier okay open bracket yeah what it's going to do is it's going to rush through the array uh, run through the array and increment each value by 1 so you know how to do that so for okay i equal to 0 int i int i for for i equal to 0 i less than size i is equal to i plus 1 what do i do arr of i equal to arr i plus 1 incrementing by 1 arr of i plus 1 fair enough okay so it is receiving an arr and a size and going through the entire arr yes and incrementing each value by 1 all of you agree it's not expecting anything back do all of you agree what the function is doing increment okay now let's go to main and let's create an array arr1 or something int arr1 uh, of five elements square bracket 5 equal to let's say 10 20 30 40 done 40 50 okay done then we'll call the function with this arr as a parameter let's call increment i'll pass arr1 as actual parameter and size which is 5 done now now i will print the array in main okay 
for i equal to 0, we'll have to create an i there. Okay, i less than 5, i equal to i plus 1, uh, printf, open bracket, scroll, uh, open bracket, printf, percentage d, space, ARR of i. Semicolon. Done. That's it. Okay. Now, wait. Now, you understand what we are doing? We are passing an array to the function along with the size, of course. The function is going to the array and uh, incrementing each value by 1. So, it is giving the array to the function. Function is taking the array and uh, it is doing plus 1 to every element. Now, what should I see on line 17? Should I see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? Or should I see the change value? Now, you will see the, the contradiction. Just now, I... Okay, first let us run it. Ah. Ah. Now, you see, there is a change. Just now I said, a copy of the parameters is made and pushed onto the stack and the original never goes to the may, uh, sorry, original never goes to the function. The function always works on a copy. Do you agree? Now, if the function is working on a copy, then the change should happen only in the function. It should not be visible in the main. Do you agree with my argument? Whereas what we are seeing here is the main, actually the array has changed. It is now, it was earlier 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Now it is 11, 12, yeah, sorry, 11, uh, whatever, 21, whatever. Correct? It has changed. What is this? Okay. Correct. Now, actually, Lot of people call this call by reference. What I showed you earlier is called call by value. To a certain extent they are true, but they are calling this as books especially tell you this as if they are two different animals. No. Nothing is further from truth. And over time people confuse people, right? This is also called by value. Now, just think here. Remember an array is not an array. Array is a pointer. So what is happening? Actually, there is no contradiction here. It is the same thing. What is happening here is, what does the main program have? A pointer and a size. Correct? A pointer and a size. That is what main program has. So, when it calls that function increment, what does it pass on to the stack? Copy of the pointer. You are with me? Copy of the pointer and copy of the size. When we say this word, copy of the pointer, pointer is an address. If suppose I, I have an address of somebody, let us say I give you the address of NGIT on a piece of paper. I am making a copy of the address and giving you. But when you access the address, will you not reach the same college? Yes. You are getting me? Yes, yes, Everybody understood? No. Yes, See, whether I give you the original address or a copy of the address, will you not reach the same address if you use that copy or the original? Same thing is happening. What is happening here is, when I go on to the stack, when this, when, when line uh, 14 is executed here, what is put on the stack is copy of the address and copy of 5 or whatever that value. Yes? The function re receives a copy of the address and that 5. But using that copy, remember, when it goes to the value, it is going to the same place. 
it is like if you i were to draw the picture okay let me go to a different page yeah let me draw this so i have the main and i have the function function is called increment please try and understand this this is increment this is main so on the stack when i am main is working it has put copy of pointer and that 5 copy of 5 whatever that is this guy is receiving the copy and he is working with the copy copy is being made not this guy has the original p and 5 five, 5 five is also copy of the 5 okay so i should say c5 okay or cn okay so c refers to copy there is a p and a n here and there is a on the stack what goes is copy of p i'll call it cp copy of n which is cn cn is only a value so now this guy retrieves cp and cp refers to an address whether it is p or cp because they are copies of the address they both refer to the same memory location because what i have passed to the function is a copy of the address but when you refer through the copy of the address or the original address you do dereferencing on original address or copy of that address will you not reach the same location you will reach the same location because i am working only on the copy of the address copy of the address does not point to a different location it is another copy of the address only the address is copied and given to you it's just like i made a chit wrote the address on you and gave it to you you will reach the same destination like what i am going to do the data is going to be the same only thing is i have given you a copy of address i have not given you copy of the data that would have been a problem i have given you a copy of the address so using that address wherever you go you will go to the same location okay so this is also what you are seeing going back to the code what you are seeing here please don't misunderstand books will tell you this is call by reference fair enough but this is also call by value only thing is the kind of animal which is passed on through the stack is different in one case it was just an integer so copy didn't have effect but in this case it is an address because we know an array is nothing but an address there is nothing called an array array is nothing but an address address means pointer so we are giving you a copy of the pointer but you will go to the same data i am not giving you copy of the data that would have been different i am giving you copy of the address the data you reach from that address and the data you reach from the original is exactly the same correct did you grasp this if you copy an address and give you original address both point to the go to the same location data will affected will be the same now you write same thing call by value we won't ask you such questions also okay call by value but this is what i want you to understand is because in textbooks you will have this call by reference call by value both are call by value very good both are call by value only difference is in one case it is data which is going in the other case it is address which is going copy of the address has different implication copy of the data has different implication that's all but both are call by value everything is call by value everything in all languages is call by value whether you go to c++ whether you go to java it's all call by value there is nothing called call by reference it is only created as a device to confuse you okay we'll stop here